Tim Burton gave the superhero genre something of a Frankenstein-like makeover. He would change the face of the superhero film forever. If Richard Donner's stunning and classic Superman was the American dream at its brightest and most hopeful, then Tim Burton's Batman was the American nightmare at its most stylish, its most dynamic and its darkest. With strong German expressionistic influences like 1920's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and 1927's Metropolis, Batman was a stylish and unique blend of long dark shadows, distorted proportions and a storyline that was aimed at an audience that seemed to long for something a little grittier. Now how Adam West's campy cape crusader made the jump to Jack Nicholson's twisted Joker might have something to do with Tim Burton's distinctively dark aesthetic or Danny Elfman's very moody but catchy score or also that the source material for Batman was the ultra-violent and very adult themed graphic novels Killing Joke by Brian Boland and of course The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. Now you might be wondering what all of this has to do with the groundbreaking Batman the animated series which by the way has just been released on Blu-ray in its entirety. Now the 1992 series was not the first cartoon to be based on Gotham's Dark Knight. If you were a teenager in the mid 90s like some of us and you saw a few episodes of the series then you will know that this show was no ordinary cartoon show, not by a long shot. But what exactly made Batman the Animated Series so different? What made it so groundbreaking and ultimately what made it a turning point? in the superhero genre and in animated TV shows. Now, of course, Tim Burton and co. have something to do with it, but there is a little bit more to the story. After the massive success of Tim Burton's Batman and its sequel, Batman Returns, Warner Brothers commissioned the now legendary series. Now, what you might know is that the series also used Danny Elfman's very famous score. And a lot of the design elements between the film and the series are practically identical. But what you might not know is that we don't just have Tim Burton to thank for this incredible series, but also none other than Mr. E.T. himself, Steven Spielberg. Now before we dive into that very interesting Steven Spielberg link, you have to remember that prior to this dark and broody series, cartoon shows at that time had practically no budget. However, Batman the Animated Series' success, at least in part I believe, lay in the fact that it could do what no other cartoon show at that time could do, and that is namely, it could recruit from the industry's best writers, designers, artists, and the best voice actors available. It had very, very high production standards, and it could draw from a very experienced and dynamic, and not to mention expensive talent pool. And this is where Steven Spielberg enters the Batcave albeit indirectly. When the world's most successful filmmaker signed a deal with Warner Brothers in 1989 to produce an animated revival of Looney Tunes in the form of Tiny Tunes, the company threw big chunks of cash at its already lucrative animation department in order to keep Mr. Spielberg happy, of course. And so, Batman the Animated Series, being one of the productions on their slate, reaped the benefits of having access to one of the most sophisticated and well-financed animation departments in the world. But to say that Batman the Animated Series' genre-defining success lay purely in the amount of pocket money it received would not be entirely true. Cartoon shows were heavily governed and censored by the Broadcasting Standards and Practices rules. This was basically a set of rules that prohibited things like, for example, one cartoon character punching another one in the face, cartoon characters running around with guns, and you could certainly not have a character, at least an animated one, bleeding on screen. That all changed when Batman arrived. Through clever editing and animation, those sneaky little editors at Warner Brothers skirted a lot of the censorship no-nos, therefore giving audiences a darker, a more realistic and edgier, and a more mature cartoon watching experience. Another unique element, at least for that time, and this is thanks to its great writing, 
is that the series dealt with more intricate storylines. It had darker themes, more mature content. It never spoke down to its young audience. Another defining element of the series, like the movies, is that the show's designers drew influence from the noir classics like Citizen Kane and the expressionist icons, the cabinets of Dr. Caligari and the game Metropolis. I mean, not many cartoon shows could say that. In fact, not many cartoon shows can say that, period. The show's sort of deco art look made it instantly recognizable. And I also feel that Batman the Animated Series harkened back to DC's other, albeit much older, animation classic. Of course, I'm talking about those gorgeous Max Fleischer Superman cartoons of the 1940s. Both had a similar sleek character design and, and both seemed to be sort of a Golden Age-esque take on iconic heroes. The series finally ended its legendary run three years later in 1995, but its legacy still lives on. Now, why was it such a turning point? Well, because it showed that cartoons didn't just have to be for kids, that they could be layered and intelligent, and that superheroes didn't have to run around with these ridiculous, delirious smiles and peace signs. They could have very human qualities and flaws, and they could deal with real life issues. I'll never forget a particular episode, and it's one that still gives me goosebumps to this day. It was called Beware the Grey Ghost, and it gives us a slightly different take on Bruce Wayne's Batman inspiration. In the episode, The Grey Ghost is a TV series that Bruce Wayne watched as a child, and it revolves around a masked detective. When a savage serial bomber runs rampage through the city of Gotham, Batman teams up with the show's old and now washed up TV star, brilliantly voiced by none other than the original Cape Crusader himself, Adam West. It's a bit of a meta episode with a very strong nostalgic feel and it pays this wonderful tribute to the heroes of yesteryear. I loved it as a teenager and I love it even more now as an adult. Batman the Animated Series has finally been released on Blu-ray in its entirety and I ordered it immediately. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that this Halloween I'm going to be spending it watching a different kind of darkness. Now what were your thoughts on this legendary series? I'd love to hear your thoughts on your favorite episodes or the show in general. Thank you so much for watching and if you did like this episode then please hit that like button. And by the way I think it's a good time to mention this. I really do appreciate the growing interaction that I have with some of you guys. I feel like I'm learning a lot from you and that is really meaningful to me. By the way I spoke about Tim Burton earlier on in the episode. If you are a fan of The Great Filmmaker, then go and check out my episode where I delve into his top 10 favorite horror movies of all time. And speaking about bats, albeit in a different form, I have something special coming up for you next time. I am going to bring to you the top 10 most underrated vampire movies of all time. So watch this space. Thanks again everyone, wishing you all a wonderful week. Be safe, be happy, be horror, and if you can't, 